Well, first of all, I want to welcome you all here. And I understand that we have some special visitors, some uh, individuals from the uh, Alaska State uh, Association of School Boards. I uh, want to welcome you uh, to Juneau and to the Sea Alaska Heritage uh, Building. Uh, I see some of my good friends from all over the state, actually. So uh, I want to uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I also want to uh, thank um, uh, the University of Alaska. Uh, we have a partnership with them with the PETA's program. Uh, I see uh, Joe Nelson, Joe Nelson, who is from the University of Alaska. Uh, in his other hat, he's also the uh, chair of the C Alaska Corporation Board of Directors. And I think in his other hat, he's also on the AFN uh, school board. So we're, we're glad that you're here. Um, this is a, a very timely um, discussion for us. Uh, education has been a priority for Alaska Native people ever since uh, our first contact with Westerners. Um, we, we fought uh, to have education. We actually uh, brought a, a case, or I think one of our first cases was the Jones case where we sought to uh, get rid of uh, our, the dual education system we had in Alaska. We had one school for whites, uh, one school for Native people, and uh, we knew that the edu level of education that we were receiving in the Native schools were not on par with what we thought that they should be. So we went to court and we were successful in uh, integrating our schools. The next case that we had was um, uh, the Molly Hooch case where we went and we said that we needed to have uh, schools in all of our schools, in all of our communities. When we did an assessment, uh, we saw that uh, there were schools in all of the non-native uh, communities with, let's say, population of 400, but in every uh, native community of, of 400, there were no schools. So in that case, uh, we, we were successful and the state of Alaska was uh, obliged to establish uh, schools in all of our rural communities. And then more recently, uh, we went to court again, uh, and this was in, I think it was 2004, uh, the Moore case. And again, it was, I have to say, our friends from uh, Western Alaska went to, uh, went to uh, court because uh, they felt that the state of Alaska wasn't meeting its constitutional obligation to provide for adequate education uh, in our rural schools. And we want to thank you know, the people who initiated uh, that case. Uh, we were successful again in that case. However, I must say that when we were pushing for schools in our communities, we didn't know that it would be at the expense of our culture and our languages, our history, and our arts. And um, our leaders, our leaders believed that it was really important that we have both a Western education as well as the ability to retain and learn our own language, culture, history, and arts in our schools. So uh, Dr. Baptiste's lecture uh, entitled Decolonizing Education, Nourishing Their Learning Spirits is timely. As we, as we face the state's fiscal crisis, and the threats of losing the gains we've made in integrating native language, culture, and arts and history into our schools, which we know uh, from all of our studies and evaluations that it leads to the improvement, the academic improvement uh, for our students, as well as, I think, enrich enriching our society in, in perpetuating uh, plural societies and a diversified society. Uh, we are fully aware of the budget crisis, the budget deficits, and we are willing to do our part to address the fiscal crisis. Uh, we are all in this situation together, but we want to ensure that the Native community and rural Alaska doesn't unduly bear the burden of the budget cuts. And so that is our, our, our challenge. Uh, Baptiste, Dr. Baptiste is a Mi'kmaq from the Potlotek First Nations in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. She has served as professor in research and leadership in Aboriginal education, formerly the Indian and Northern Education Program, 
in the Department of Educational Foundations at the University of Saskatchewan since 1993. A mother of three, she and her husband, uh, J. Young, Youngblood Henderson, a colleague of mine, went to school with him, uh -huh. mm -hmm. so I'm glad to meet her. Yeah. Uh, she's, they made their home uh, in Saskatoon, their home after many years of living in uh, away and working among First Nations schools and community organizations. Dr. Baptiste has also published many articles and scholarly papers in books, journals, and documents and remains involved in research on Aboriginal education, languages, and teachers, and teachers' education. Please uh, join with me in welcoming Dr. Baptiste. <laughs> Well, Arlene, uh, Rosita, and uh, great to see you again. Well, Darcy, I'm Hutet, Juno, Alaska, Aquan, Tlingit Territory, Akish, Nindeluisi, Mribadi, Satle, we bottle a deck, Unamagi. Well, Darcy, I'm sit when Beji Dayo, Kachit, Naji, Kitsduio. So I want to just say thank you all for being here and, and greeting me and, and, and bringing um, uh, me this far into uh, your territory to speak. I am deeply honored to be back uh, in the United States. I am, I'm born um, um, in the United States, but I'm going to just tell you a little bit about my background first as I start. But before I do so, I want to acknowledge uh, the Aquan Tlinka territory and Gunishchish. Uh, well, Ali. Um, and on these territories, and I think it's really important that everyone understand why we recognize indigenous territories. We do so because, first of all, we want to recognize and honor the stewards and owners of the lands and the territories. We do that also in showing respect for the peoples of, that, of these lands, as well as recognize and acknowledge respect and uh, relationship and reciprocity as a way of living upon this land. We also want to, and in, in the United States and Canada, we also are working on uh, trying to make it visible that uh, indigenous peoples uh, are the, have been silenced, invisible and marginalized, and yet are the original owners and caretakers of the land, the territory, and the ecology. I want to start off by saying that, you know, when I'm using these words like Native American, American Indian, Indigenous, Aboriginal, are all uh, terms that are, have been in flux and contested terms, that all of us have names for who we are. In my territory, we've been called Ulnu, uh, our Ulnu nation and our Ulnu territory. But over the years, we then were called Mi'kmaq, and, and later on, the colonists called us Micmac. Um, so these are very much contested terms and constantly in, uh, in flux. Um, one of the things that we always do when we attend anywhere is we always give a, a, an understanding of people who, who we are, because in so doing, we provide to our indigenous peoples from all around that come from us where we come from and what is our cultural location, and that in so doing, we make connections with the people at a political, cultural, and social level. This is my family, my, my me um, in um, um, John and Annie, both of who passed, but um, in, in about 1947, before I was born, you don't need to start counting, I wasn't born then, but my parents left and went to the United States um, on a sojourn to work in the, in the potato industry and to work in the farms. Uh, my father decided, because he had some debts that he wanted to pay off, that he would be gone and would go for several uh, months and maybe even a year. And my mother, who had just had a baby, um, not me, but my sister, uh, decided that it was important for her to go with her, her husband. Um, and she <coughs> said at the time, I know what men do in the camps. I'm going with you. <laughs> <laughs> And so my parents left, but on the way, they took my sister, who was now of school age, to the residential school. And it was because my, my family 
had heard that uh, at the residential school, she, need, she would get her religious instruction, she would get clothing, she would get food, she would get, um, and it was assumed that these were kind and generous people who would be very loving, um, which was not the case. Um, and so my parents took her to the school and meanwhile went on to, um, to the camps and lived there um, trying to make a living um, for several years before they went back in, to get my sister who had suffered immensely by those years away. But while we were in the States, um, as I was born there, um, my parents continued to live both in terms of Mi'kmaq language um, and inviting people from around to spend their time with us as well. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in a Mi'kmaq speaking home, but because <coughs> I was in this English speaking territory and had no friends that were Mi'kmaq, I ended up with a much better grasp of English language than I do of my own Mi'kmaq language. But it was in that territory that my, my parents continued to live as Mi'kmaq people, as people who were um, basket makers. And, it, and my friend here, as I uh, uh, arrived, uh, showed me the basket that uh, I shared with her many years ago, uh, as was sold to, um, to uh, her while she was in one of my students at Berkeley because after I finished uh, at the University of uh, at University of Maine and got my education degree I went on to Harvard uh, and then on to uh, Berkeley where I taught for a few <coughs> years and I got my doctorate degree at Stanford University so I've had some of the most stellar of of Western education in the course of my developing my um, myself but my people uh, continued to develop um, these skills, and my parents taught this to us. And we grew up learning how to live in the forest, living with the land, and living with the materials that came from that particular land. I've been in the Canada for now, oh, I would say, to, uh, since 1974, when after I got my, doc uh, my, um, my doctorate degree, uh, I went back, or my, actually went back with my master's degree, but then came back, finished my doctorate degree, and then went back home in 84. But in Canada, our population is over 1.4 million of Aboriginal people are in Canada, representing 4% of the population. This population is growing and escalating immensely. We have six out of 10 of our people who are under the age of 29. And by the regional mm -hmm. population demographics, by 27, it's estimated that Aboriginal people from 20 to 29 years old may comprise 30% of the total population in Saskatchewan, 24% in Manitoba, 40% in the Yukon, and 58% in the Northwest Territories. So this emerging, uh, bulging population of, uh, in youth, Aboriginal youth, has become a, of great concern to um, the schools and to the country at large. And so for a very long time, since I've been, you know, I graduated in 1983, being one of the two or three of the only people in Canada with a doctorate degree, um, we have only just begun to do the kind of research that's needed to develop and mobilize indigenous knowledges and to contribute to and improve the education of all learners. Before that, much of the research had been in terms of how do we get indigenous students into the regular systems and how do they continue to uh, thrive in that system. And even though we talked about how do we build in um, language and culture, those things did not happen. Uh, one of the things that in the course of doing some of the research, we've discovered that um, people um, have been looking at what would happen if First Nations, Métis, and Inuit students were at the same level as the other students and work in the workforce. They found that in Saskatchewan, the GTP would rise at $1.8 billion annually. If we were to close the education gap in Saskatchewan alone, that we would find a $900 billion um, dollar GDP rise. If we were to look at it across Canada, the Aboriginal population reaching the same level of education and social well-being as their non-Aboriginal counterparts, Canada would be uh, expected to rise by $401 billion dollars with a savings of 115 billion by government expenditures in 
through 2026. What has happened, is, though, is that it, whether you come from Canada or the States or Bolivia or New Zealand or Australia or Africa, the situation has all been the same. And that is that we've all had lived under a rule of colonization. The people have been marginalized, powerless. Racism is rampant. Violence is part of the life they've had to leave. And cultural imperialism <coughs> is basically the foundation of everything within those particular countries. Among the other kinds of things that are true of these peoples is that we all indigenous peoples are place-based cultures, that where we live on the land, in the territory, with the ecology, that these people, our peoples, have been living there and thriving, have had uh, lands and languages that have been built upon those particular places. Our language structures and our words for places are reflected in those things. Our rural views are similar, not the same, but they are all in with a, a notion of being interconnected with our lands and our territories and place. That is very spiritually grounded, as well as relational, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But one of the leading things is that all indigenous people around the world have been resilient in all of their places. At the, in the University of, um, of uh, in Canada, um, and of late, we have been moving to a level of indigenization across all the campuses. David Bernard, who was a chair of the University's Canada in 2015 and president of the University of Manitoba, uh, noted when they passed the University's Canada Protocol on Indigenous Education that when understanding of First Nation, Métis, and other Indigenous cultures is woven through all of our campuses, then real change will occur. And the issue for us has always been this one, is that regardless of whether we have had indigenous elders in our communities or whether or not we have been in, in, um, in going to schools, all of us everywhere in almost every country in the world have been marinated in Eurocentrism. And Eurocentrism is in itself a macro theory, ultra theory that is the dominant theory um, with many connecting ideas, imaginative and institutional context that informs contemporary scholarship, opinion, and law. If we could think of Eurocentrism um, under the, uh, the uh, work of uh, James Blount, James Blout talked about how Eurocentrism was like a center and a periphery. And the center was all-knowing, all-superior, and all giving everything to the periphery, which was deficient, needing, and so on, and, and under development. And so it, that kind of education, that kind of um, governance, that kind of laws, and so on, were all built around this particular concept. And it, it holds that, you know, that, that, that the, the superiority of one knowledge system at the time, which were Europeans and the settlers who brought it, was, the, was then the diffusing element of that knowledge that was then sent throughout the world, whether it was Africa or, or Australia, New Zealand, to um, in all the parts of the world. And so it is and has been that education in the institution, whether it's in the elementary schools or whether it's in the universities, has been Eurocentric from its very core. So what we're working with is how do we begin to localize and create a content that is more in keeping with the territory and with the people in them. Um, in the last few years, we've had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, and that commission has just finished its work on Indian residential schools. 150,000 children have been over that, actually, that have been part of the Aboriginal um, schools of 100, over 100 schools uh, across Canada, starting from as early as 1870 and continuing on until 1996. So we've got a lot of people who have been suffering from the effects of Indian residential schools that were basically the uh, failures that came from their lost languages and knowledges, their skills, their connectedness to their families and their land and language, their community, their culture, their spirituality, their indigenous humanity, their sciences and humanities and so on. <coughs> 
And this has begun and, and has continued to contribute to what we call nihilism. Nihilism is a kind of meaninglessness that many of our youth feel, disconnected from their culture, from community, disconnected from anything that has meaning because within our, in a modern contemporary world that keeps on changing, unfolding in, in new ways, there's very little to hold on to. And so our children are left floundering with what is there to hold on to, what is meaningful. And so this kind of thing continues throughout schooling as when we have our, our children who come out uh, to the schools, we have, says Ningwakwe George, who did a literature review, which is online in the CCL website, we have emotional dropouts from the institutions before the physical dropout. We need to dismantle fears if we are to engage the spirit, fulfill their needs, not ours, but our learners' needs. Ningwakwe George is a, a, a wonderful, um, teacher and educator and she has an online Ningwakwe literacy um, work that she does. In a, Nancy Cooper, a friend of mine, says, she, I've worked in literacy for 15 years and I know that almost 99.9% .9 of learners that come into the literacy programs have dealt with major trauma in their lives and there are a lot of blocks. And so when we begin to look at whether how people move out from these residential schools or partial education, they ha end up feeling um, that they have missed something in life, they've lost something in their lives, and they have emotional blocks that continue. In the work that I've done, and, and cognitive imperialism was one of the words I coined many years back, after working with uh, a, um, a, in, a scholar at uh, Stanford University, uh, Martin Carnoy was, did a book on cultural imperialism and I took that course and when I wrote my paper I said Cog it is not cultural imperialism alone but cognitive imperialism. It's what we lose when we end up losing our languages, we lose our connections and our relations to land and place and, and, and we are then giving a cognitive imperialistic um, education. And that cognitive imperialistic education has defined success as assimilation. When people look at me, they say, oh, you're so accomplished, you're so well done, you, you, you speak so well. And I say, well, that's because I lost my language. That's because I, I ended up where my parents had to leave because there was no way to live within their own homeland to be able to thrive and survive. And so I have had to lose that. And in so losing that, I've recognized what I've lost, and I go back and I try to find ways to help people to gain what I think is important that everyone should have. And we need to rethink about what success then means in relation to education. It erodes our collective cultures, it languages and communities, and creates multiple oppressions that have been race, classed, and gendered, and normalized in discourses and if of the hidden <laughs> curriculum. It's resulted in damaged identities and negative self-concept. And I always, I can't remember where I found this wonderful, uh, I think it was Elizabeth Minnick in uh, Transforming Curriculum when she wrote, silence is the shield of domination. When you are in a school, when you're in a place and indigenous peoples are not present, indigenous peoples are, are not heard, and there's a whole silence of indigenous people within that territory, it is a signal, it is a symptom of domination. So these issues of cognitive imperialism continues and it reflects an othering and a notion of difference and a soul wound on the people, which was a wonderful word I got from um, da -da 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 Native American post-colonial psychology. Anybody? No? Okay came from that book. <laughs> I'll remember it uh, tomorrow. <laughs> so, but what I'm trying to say is that cognitive imperialism is what we have lived, what we have, and what we know. And it is that every student, every person is both a beneficiary or a victim of that particular kind of system. Many of us who have been privileged with the language that goes with it are usually not the victim of it. But those of us who have been, it is, doesn't reflect our system, it doesn't reflect our ways of knowing, we have become the, the victim of it. So there are very few 
uh, places where we are been privileged to learn about decolonization, about indigenous knowledge and education and so on. And so in this space, we must be critical change agents and healers. In Canada, the, the context is changing, much as it is in the United States and around the world, I might add. In Canada, our ch changing agents have been um, in 19, um, well, I'll start off at 72, when Indian control of Indian education came into being. And since that time, um, various communities have taken over control of their schools little by little um, and, and until we have been able to move toward a more full control. Unfortunately, that control has not come with also the curriculum because the curriculum was by, defined by the state, defined by the provinces. They had control of the curriculum, and so all of our schools then had their education as administration, but we had to follow the provincial curriculum. <coughs> so in 1982, uh, the Canada uh, entered into the Constitution. They had a Constitution before. It was called the British North America Act. But when they brought their constitution home, they recognized that they would not be a country without treaties. And so the, in section 35, one is the affirmation of um, Aboriginal and treaty rights. And so Aboriginal education then is a historical imperative. It also is, because of the growing population, an economic imperative for all the provinces and territories. And since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission came out with its, with its blast of, uh, of knowledge about what had happened to indigenous people, our First Nations people, and Métis and Inuit people in, throughout Canada, that they have a moral imperative to change that. And that moral imperative is a call to action with 92 recommendations that have been set out as a call to action for all people that even though your, your parents, uh, your ancestors, you feel were not involved with this Indian residential school in the history of indigenous people, it is now. And by your knowledge, by your awareness, everyone becomes implicated and your decision every day is a decision about which the Truth and Reconciliation asks for everyone to reconcile their knowledge, their histories, and their awareness of indigenous peoples to that. We also have at the international level the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, and it sets out in several provisions uh, the rights to education, the right to having your own, our own languages, our cultures, our communities, our humanities, our histories, and so on, and that we should have control over ourselves and, and our learning and cultural properties, uh, which is in a self-determination imperative. In Canada, there is some changes going on, and among those changes have been in the last, since, uh, in, especially uh, the uh, uh, Canadian Council of Ministers of Education have, uh, since the late, or actually early um, 2000, have been working on developing their priorities in Aboriginal education. The deans of education it's across Canada all the colleges that have deans of education set out a dean's accord on indigenous education, which you can all find online if you need to read about it. But it, it is saying we are going in all colleges and every education college, we're going to prioritize Aboriginal education and the successes of Aboriginal students. And we are also going to include indigenous knowledges. We're going to learn about them and include them in the curriculum. And we're going to take measures in effect to make sure that all teachers, not just First Nation teachers, not Métis, not Inuit, but all teachers in all schools in everywhere understand the, the educational imperative that's involving Indigenous children. That is, was a major event that happened in 2010. In 2015, the Universities Canada set out a plan, a 13-point plan, and in that 13-point plan on Aboriginal education, they included all this, the need for and the importance of success of Indigenous children throughout Canada and in the youth, and also to find ways to bring intercultural understanding between non-Indigenous and Indigenous students so that no longer are there, is there a divide, but everyone <coughs> will understand what, the, what 
um, those are coming from. In all the universities, all the presidents, and many of them even are beginning to learn the native languages of the local place, these indigenous um, people are recognizing, like I did at the beginning, every place, every university is uh, now uh, moving toward recognizing the territories of indigenous people in every, in every meeting, every conference that is going on in the local places. In Manitoba, well, Saskatchewan first, but Manitoba then later, and most currently, Nova Scotia has mandated treaty education throughout K-12. to That means that everyone in all the schools will know what land they come from and what are the histories of the treaty of, on which their, their land is located and on which um, Canada and its constitution is founded. In British Columbia, they have established an indigenous education imperative that all schools, K to 12, will know not just about treaties, but all about the uh, about Aboriginal youth and students and culture. And you can find all of this stuff is all online. If you need to um, uh, have any of this information, send me an email, and I will um, deliver up those things to you. For me, in the book, book I, the book I'd done uh, called "Decolonizing Education: Nourishing the Learning Spirit," which I will pass it then around to you, um, I've talked about decolonization as an important but two-prong approach. And while decolonization is a contested term as well, um, it is about deconstruction. And first of all, we have to understand what it is that colonization has created. What have been the policies and practices that all of these all of these uh, uh, schools and um, boards and so on have been all created without indigenous input. And so what we need to do is look through them and begin to think about what would have changed if indigenous people were at the table. What are the policies that we need to now examine that would, if and when, and, and because they are at the table, what is the difference and how do we change those? So there is, we need to expose the political, moral, and ethical inadequacies of colonization that is rampant throughout the curriculum, through the policies that are in there, as well as in the practices and pedagogies. And all of the research that at present is sort of like the old, like the, the, um, um, no Child Left Behind, where all of the testing was done on non-Indigenous children and then applied to Indigenous children, right, as the norm. And thus, how will they ever be part of that particular, they, 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 they never make the mark. Similarly, if we were to look at Indigenous or look at the education systems that we have today and they were changed, to reflect the people who are part of that schooling, then perhaps we might then be able to find more parity with the kinds of success rates as they come through. The second part and most important part is the reconstruction. The reconstruction is from, done by indigenous people and with indigenous people. It is not for indigenous people. And in this reconstruction, it means that indigenous people need to reconstruct our languages, our cultures, our communities, our sense of well-being. Our children are connecting with our, our communities in terms of their teachings and indigenous knowledges that come from us. And what I'd like to point out is that all of us, wherever, whatever we are doing, are implicated in the imperial subjugation of indigenous peoples. We need to acknowledge that we are implicated and that acknowledging is not have to be a negative stagnant place where many people find themselves fearful and scared of taking on meeting with indigenous people but rather it can be a springboard for action and consciousness as cited by Mather and Wong. In the deconstruction, we need to develop a awareness and critique of Eurocentrism, colonial bias, and racialized negative discourses and values and its effect on everyone. I teach in the College of Education, Anti-Racist Education. And in teaching students about whiteness and about privilege and dominance and colonization, imperialism and cultural imperialism and cognitive imperialism, they have no idea because they have been white and 
and dominant that they have no understood what that relationship has been and by understanding thereby where whiteness their privilege their colonial histories come into being then they begin to realize what has happened to indigenous people and they begin from there so it is also about examining the laws and the effects on policies and, and histories and the treatment of indigenous people. It is recognizing the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the uh, Indian Control, I mean the um, uh, res Indian Residential Schools. And we need to unpack the significance of the situations in which indigenous people around the world are living in. Many people live in poverty. Many people live in dysfunctional homes. Many people live with alcoholism and, and other kinds of drug addictions. But this is not indigenous people's fault. This is not indigenous people's lives. It is the situation in which they have been put in because of the, the colonial history in which they've lived. Many people who look at, at poverty in that light think this is because of indigenous people can't do X, Y, and Z. Rather it is that they have lived so long under a colonial uh, empire that they have no other way to, to come out of it. And many people, once they have come through a, their own addictions, they begin to grab a hold of their own well-being, their own sense of family, self, and community. It's there that we begin to see the renaissance of indigenous people grow. We also need to address the intergenerational trauma and of loss and of um, because of the loss of languages and why it seems so important for us today as indigenous people to have our languages. Back in the days when I was teaching bilingual bicultural education, that was some you know back in the 70s, and still the <coughs> same issue is today. So we go you know flip up you know so many years. This issue is no more different but even more imperative today than even was then when I was teaching that course. Um, so we need to be building on collective agency, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. What I think is important by looking at the reconstructive principles, we need to engage heterogeneity and diversity as a norm. What, what usually, you know, when we think about university, we think about the one, how about we should really be calling it the diversity? Um, actually, we want to engage the indigenous of multiple norms as opposed to having one singular knowledge system. We need to begin to embrace the respectful discourses regarding our First Nation, Métis, Inuit people as well as indigenous people. In Canada, we had a, um, a CBC, which is our, you know, your, your, your big largest uh, government um, um, broadcasting company has been, um, through the Indian residential school, through many kinds of things, have been uh, broadcasting about indigenous peoples. And in so doing, there has been this tremendous backlash on their blogs, anti-hate to indigenous people. And because of that, the CBC cut out all of their blogs under their, under their news releases because they said this is too viral and too, too damaging to anybody because everything that came out for indigenous people would be a layering of everything about indigenous people as drunks and, and so on. And so we need to rethink what is the discourse, what is the way that we talk about indigenous people and that needs to be filtered through schools, through, um, through our systems, in the, in the back rooms of our, uh, our classrooms and, and in, our, in our staff lounges and so on. We need to rethink what distinctiveness and difference means and how they are represented. Because indigenous people need to be involved in how we represent ourselves. It cannot be the stereotypes, it cannot be the kinds of things that says whether it's romantic, whether it is, um, wh whether it's uh, uh, issues about our being protesters, whatever the kinds of things, we need to have some uh, way to address how we want to represent our particular issues.
We need to reconceptualize the mainstream as changing and a fluid place with many voices, experiences, and knowledges. We have. I, I draw your attention to the ar Article 13 of the uh, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People that says that Indigenous people have the right to revitalize, use, develop, and transmit to future generations their languages, their philosophies, their histories, their oral traditions, their writing systems, and their literatures. And it is with that I hope that I pass on to my one grandson here uh, who is now um, six years old. Uh, and who is in now um, in a immer Mi'kmaq immersion school in my community. Mm -hmm. That at one time it was just a classroom, and but now they have taken all the immersion children from the from the the other school, and they have created a separate school for them. And for the first time, they are now in a Mi'kmaq immersion school, and that's where he is growing up. So one of the, the important kinds of things, thank you, <laughs> is the indigenous renaissance. The indigenous renaissance has been emerging over the last uh, 40 years. Um, it has come about as a result of, I would say, you know, when Ford Foundation began bringing um, to Harvard uh, Aboriginal scholars and leaders, uh, to get their education degree. Rosita was there at that time. I was there, my husband was there, I met him there. He was my tutor. <laughs> um, we have had, the indigenous renaissance has been emerging. And the indigenous renaissance has been part of a movement of where indigenous people have come back to finding out who we are. And many of us, for example, when I did my doctoral degree at Stanford University, after looking at everything which was a problem, because they said you had to find a problem, everything was a problem, I finally came upon indigenous, my indigenous languages and community. I said, what I did my dissertation on was an historical investigation of the social and cultural consequences of Mi'kmaq literacy, a high face validity title for doing an examination of orthography systems that had been going in my community and looking at how they grew and came about and diffused. And, and the question that I had was how could our language systems grow into a orthography system when we were all fighting about them? And we were fighting because somebody w was connecting their religious um, uh, priests to one system and to, you know, Protestantism to another system. And that's not what it was. It was about a different kind of writing system that had uh, linguistics at its core. So this kind of uh, education system led me to doing my own history of my own people. And it was the way in which I recovered and discovered who my people were, what we had lived through, and also brought some coherence finally to my life that I lived having gone across the border to live all most of my life. So it's in this that I bring then this organic consciousness that's imploding, to, uh, that unfolding to meet the urgent crisis that we are contemporarily having. You know, one of the great um, Yupik uh, scholars, Oscar Coagli, did his research similarly. Greg Cohete did his similarly. If you look at all our indigenous scholars, they all have done the same. And all of it has been looking at and finding from within their own, hum their own community, their own cultures, and their own families, and animating it in, an, in their humanities, in their sciences, in their legal traditions. My husband did the same. Raising the uh, potential opportunity for shared knowledge and a sustainable life, and articulating um, the principles of social and cognitive justice and existence for indigenous people. Cognitive justice, if we look at cognitive imperialism, cognitive justice, these are the things that I hope that you'll take away from this particular presentation. Cognitive justice I got from a dear friend, uh, Catherine Hoppers, who is a, um, a African scholar 
Now the inspirations for the Renaissance has come about as a need for the healing of, of in the post-residential school era, dealing with trauma, stereotypes, and intergenerational pain. It has also been the, the building of this critical mass of Aboriginal scholars and teachers drawing upon their indigenous elders knowledge, teachings, for doing their scholarly work. And so many of us have, have, uh, have been blessed to have among us our, our elders that we can go back to and talk with and learn from and continue to learn from. And we need to also become aware of the, of the indigenous ways of knowing language, cultures, and customs and in order for us to be able to build the successes for our own learners. I have a graduate student who's working now in the north in, um, in Iqaluit and he's looking at success and he said, well, I want to do it. I want to, I want to look at success and he wanted to measure success with, and I knew what the outcomes was going to be of that study. And I said, more importantly is understanding what the people think success means to them. It is not what others think success to be. It's more important you find out what they think is important to their success. Talking to those who have went through school, the youth and so on, how did they measure their success and how did it affect them and how do they now measure their success and what are they doing to promote that. And so those kinds of things are the, the ways in which we begin to work toward reclaiming this holistic learning process. I have only probably a few minutes left, but I'm going to just try to get through a couple of things. And one is to, to remember for those people who are working with the schools to make your cognitive house stronger in accommodating indigenous knowledge. If you were to take an, an, our, our, our our longhouses, many of them have rafters and beams in the longhouse. When you add more people, you add more rafters or you make the rafters longer. So what we need to do is we need to extend the rafters in our, in our places to be inclusive of our indigenous knowledges, our peoples and relationships. We need to invest in more Aboriginal hires. Grow your own, for example. Um, and not just trying to um, take away from areas like indigenous niches that currently exist. While we extend the rafters and make the other indigenous, it isn't to lessen what is already there. The programs that have been successful for teachers or lawyers or social workers or whomever, those need to stay as well as to make others to be part of that. We need to also understand that elders are full-fledged knowledge holders, not just mystical prayer leaders who do not have teacher rights and privileges and don't get paid. So we need to add that to our ways of recognizing through our world that our, our, how, we, how we identify and define teachers. And we need to build in multiple networks of conversation, funding, program, time, space, and so on. I give you these as one of the work I had um, Ningwakwe George do for me. And my, in the, I had a bundle with the Canadian Council on Learning uh, called the Aboriginal Learning Knowledge Center. And I was, the Nourishing the Learning Spirit was my bundle. And I set out to ask her if she would do a lit review. That is online. I invite you to look for that because it is there. And it's a wonderful literature review that looks at both the science and indigenous concepts around indigeneity and learning spirit. And the worldview is holistic. We are spirit, heart, mind, and body. We are part of creation. We are not separate from it. The learning spirit has a purpose and gifts, so we need to reawaken the learning spirit. And everything has spirit and energy, and we are all part of it. I would finally like to, I'm going to, um, I see I've got to, a couple of things I can do. Um, I was reading on the way here about Inuit communication. And it was the Alaskan Inuit Improvement Strategy. And they said Inuit communication gets meaning not only from words, but also body language, mood, ways of behaving, norms, and the situation. And much is implied and hinted rather than said in direct contrast to Western communication, where more of the message is contained in words. When Inuit children face this difference, 
in communication with their Western teachers, they are at risk of being labeled as shy, quiet, withdrawn, or worse, as incapable of learning. So what we have to remember that you have different styles and ways of knowing and being. And we, by understanding the communities where they're coming from, by understanding those things, we can begin to understand and unpack those notions of success that takes and creates winners and losers. And we need to unpack the who is and what is served and who is privileged and is already at the starting line and who is not when they are brought into the education systems. So what stands in the obstacles in the path of the disadvantaged? So we need to think about if we played indigenous languages, the language of the instruction, who then is advantaged as opposed to who is then disadvantaged, and then you begin to see how these begin to play out. And so promoting an immersion class in indigenous language and monitoring their successes in there would be an important way to do it. Uh, we started off immersion language education many years ago, and one of the things that the teachers noticed that is that you had some teach students who were going into the English stream, who are who are our Mi'kmaq students, and then we had a bunch of students who were going into the Mi'kmaq immersion stream, and these teachers, as when they looked at the scores of the children who went after they finished the four years of immersion programming, after the, actually they had five years of immersion programming, they noticed that the scores of the children who were in immersion <coughs> programming ha were, were higher than the scores of those who started off in English and went through the English stream. That those children who learned to read in Mi'kmaq and learned to think and were critical thinkers in Mi'kmaq were better learners because they had learned how to do this in Mi'kmaq and when they went into the English stream they brought all their critical thinking skills with them and they could look at things from different lights and different angles and so on. They also had a better behavior that children who were in these Mi'kmaq immersion were learning the, how to behave because they were following the family and community traditions. It wasn't like every year, oh, let's put on the board what our classroom rules are going to be, every year changing and everybody having to accommodate to that. What they did is they drew upon the, the, the original teachings in the community and said, this is the original, this is how we behave, this is what it means to behave, and they follow all the classes throughout follow the same thing so that when these children left and went into the English speaking stream and they found kids misbehaving they'd say why are you acting like that why are you behaving like that that is not our people don't behave like that and so they became then were in there trying to re-educate the other classroom because these ones only knew how to behave according to a classroom that changed every year its rules about how to behave. Hence individual, individual classrooms as opposed to collectivities. Which gets to how important it is that we teach the learning spirit through our open communications, developing our relationships, developing our students' passions and strengths, varying teaching styles and environment to the students, promoting indigenous leadership among those students. When you get leaders in that school starting very early, they become leaders throughout. They teach also teaching parenting skills as traditional knowledge so that young people know learn how to become a parent and teach that in there in the in the schools and making boards and committees and other political areas open to indigenous representation nothing about us without us is a mantra <laughs> that all indigenous people hold to nothing about us without us so indigenization, Aboriginal education, whether it's indigenization in the classrooms or whatever, research, nothing about us without us. We need to invest in IK. We need to invest in indigenous knowledges and we need to grow our own from within our communities. We need to focus on collective and individual self-determination. One of the ways in which to do that is when we look at the World Indigenous Nations Higher Education Consortium. 
This is a certification um, group that comes from all around the world of indigenous peoples <coughs> built on the, um, the, on, the uni um, on the UN Declaration of the Rights <coughs> of Indigenous People. And that particular self-determining is ways in which if you are building an indigenous program, you don't just go within your system and ask, how are we doing? Go, whether it is an elementary uh, immersion program to a university program, go to the World Indigenous Nations Higher Education Consortium and ask them to be certified, certified as being a indigenous program under the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. That's one of the ways. So we need to consider all of those outcomes and so on. I wanted to share one last thing, and that is that we, in the, in, we did work on this uh, Canadian Council on Learning, the Aboriginal Learning Knowledge Place. We had many bundles. We had many people. We had many things. We lasted for three, um, five years. And it was, a, unfortunately, a, an initiative that grew under a former government. And when the new government came in, killed it, even though it was making tremendous strides. And um, that a lot of the work is still present in, the, in our work. I want to show you something, and that is that what we created was the Aboriginal, uh, the, first, the holistic learning models. And what we asked is, what does learning mean to you? Now this is our First Nations learning, where in the middle we have um, Western education, indigenous knowledge, and within spiritual, mental, emotional, and um, physical. physical. Yeah, and then you have the elementary, secondary, workplace, adult, intergenerational rings of learning. Here are all the the nurturing uh, mentors, parents, teachers, elders, all feeding onto our our learning tree, which is this is in the center being linked to our languages, our traditions, our ceremonies, and so on, from which, if we grow up, then we have a spiritual, social, economic, political, and collective well-being. In another one we did was with, the, with Inuit. And in the Inuit one, this is, a, is that they didn't have trees in the tundra, so this is their game. <laughs> And their game, uh, they all pick this, is, is that they are, all of the people in the community are being held together that their culture and their land and their people and the source, the, the spiritual element of their, of their domain, their sila, is all encompassing around our, our, our infant, our child, and so on as they journey through lifelong learning. And that those who pass away continue to support those people by virtue of how all children are named after a relative from a former um, that has passed away. And so they still contribute to building on that collective well-being. And that said, this is my last, last one, it is that the, um, our uh, redefining success in Aboriginal lifelong learning is really about living a good life, becoming human, protecting the earth to ensure the sustainability of all life. It is around these key attributes of, in, of Aboriginal learning that is common to First Nation, Métis, and Inuit. I didn't do the last one. Uh, learning is holistic, extends from self to family community. Learning, life, learning is lifelong and intergenerational. Learning experiential, all senses. Learning is rooted in Aboriginal languages and culture. Learning is communal activity. Learning is place-based and spiritually oriented. And learning integrates Aboriginal and Western knowledge and traditions. And when we apply the two-eyed seeing to all of our learning, then we become educated. And that is how we would like to have everyone go. And this is not just for uh, Aboriginal people or for Indigenous people. It is for all children. Because once you learn those kinds of things, then you learn to take care of your land, your water, your people, your relationships with your elders and others. And so, you know, when we begin to think about what is Indigenous knowledge, we can find that in those kinds of teachings. And it is not a teaching that is just for us but is for everyone. Thank you, and with that, I offer you more of my books. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, on the education part, I stand behind you in all of that. With one of the, what would your response be towards? Um, I imagine the people who poison the water in Flint uh, were highly educated. Well, again, when you have an education that is cognitively imperialistic, then you're looking at an education that focuses on certain interests as opposed to collective norms of what works for everyone. So interest, money, other kinds of things have been the neoliberal kind of market economy that has led a lot of, to our, our problems today. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Sorry? Uh, I read something quite alarming about the Canadian uh, government in that uh, people who are na native Canadians have been going to jail for trying to put na natives in jail for life for mediocre things such as they have had a girl that was in high school that said that her teacher was wrong on this one issue and tried to collect, correct her, her high school teacher. So her high school teacher called the police on her and then they found that she's been in jail for the last 17 years for talking back to her teacher. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and what the, it's been kind of a shame of the United Nations, the Canadian uh, the Canadian government is under a huge investigation by the United Nations for these human rights abuse crimes. In indigenous people, basically the, the judges, et cetera, for mediocre crimes, like somebody's 10, uh, five miles over the speed limit while they're driving, they get pulled over by a police car, and they've been in jail for the last 20 years. And they're coming under uh, investigation by the United Nations, and the United Nations has has uh, their Canadian government is coming in, in outrageous scrutiny for that. We have a very similar problem here in the state of Alaska. Not quite that extensive, but very similar. Yeah. In that non-native non people will go to, uh, go to see the, the, they go to before a judge and they got a DWI. And the non-native person will get, oh, two or three months. Mm -hmm. But the native person will get like three, four years. Mm -hmm. And so it's very, uh, it's yeah. very similar. There's some well, I would say that racism, discrimination, poverty have been the kinds of issues that have created a, the, from the residential school pipeline has gone from Indian residential schools into the jails. We have in many of our in provinces, 80% of the people who are First Nations and Métis <coughs> as the uh, populations in, our, in, in jails. And the, for women, they're even higher, um, that in, indigenous women are jailed because of the kinds of um, violence that has happened to the women in their communities. Sometimes because of that in the de defending themselves without having a proper uh, legal system that it acknowledges the situations they're living under where they don't have monies in order to get uh, legal representation and so on. These have been contributing more or less to the reasons why we have many, many of our people for going from the um, residential schools, living in homes that have had people who have are still dealing with the trauma uh, and intergenerational abuse from the residential schools, and they are going into the um, into uh, high crime as well as as those who are victims of crime, but who are not able to defend themselves because they don't have the monies to do that. So across Canada, it is true. Um, it is also that you know our government changed last year. I don't know if you knew that. Um, but we have now a new, a, a, uh, in Canada, with, under the new uh, administration of Justin Trudeau as our Prime Minister, we do have an Attorney General for the first time as an Indigenous woman, Jody uh, Rabel. And um, we have, under this new administration, having to correct all of what has happened in these last, you know, hundreds of years. We do have hope I think we do have we have new ways to deal with it um, but it is nowhere can we can the door change even if you get the best president in the world 
which I pray to God you guys find something better here. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, it can, it, it, when you have a president as you had, with similar values as our new prime minister has, um, only so much gets done. But we don't have a system quite like here. Ours is a little bit different. And so I'm hoping that we can be able to make the changes we need to make in the coming years. But I know that there is a new norm. There is a new voice. There is new ideas. And there's new places where all of a sudden indigenous people, indigenization, new thoughts about indigenous knowledge, treaties, um, and, and issues around self-determination, sovereignty, and so on, are new words on the new lips of our new government. And we have a long ways to go to change it. But one of the things that's happening is that we are becoming ever so much aware of what the Indian residential schools have done to people in creating that kind of, that whole group of people who are in jails today. And we're still having to deal with that, as well as the youth today who aren't in jails yet, who are into drugs and alcohol and other kinds of things, but are we need to find ways to build an education system, a social system, a social network that will enable them to be able to grow better and into who they were and are and such that we can all grow and heal from it. So we're a long ways to go. I'd like to bring something else up. It's the design between, um, between 18, between the population of the uh, state of Alaska, Alaska is, is estimated to be about 18%, and yet they've taken about 32% uh, of the population in jails. And also, um, natives are getting, uh, non-natives will be getting like two months of probation, and natives will be getting like five years of probation. Mm -hmm. So they get thrown in jail because they don't make it to one appointment or another, and they have to jump through this hoop and that hoop and that hoop, and that hoop and and then they get thrown back in jail yeah. constantly. Well, there lies the, the issue of cognitive imperialism, Eurocentrism, and the dissonance that happens when you are bringing these two systems together. That's why we need to know about the system that we come from and how do we bring to make changes to that other system that we're working with, a more transsystemic, what I call a transsystemic um, uh, amelioration of our education and our, our social systems. But thank you very much. I know you've come to lunch here, and now we need to have you have your lunch before you go back here. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. A quick reminder that this lecture will be posted on our website within a week or so. So I invite you to come back. And her PowerPoint will be there, too, so along with the lecture, so you can see everything. That yeah. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming here because I think there were some very powerful messages that we could take. I know we're, we're all dealing with this budget crisis, and I think if you take a look at, at her, especially her first page, where it can be a cost savings to us if we educate our people, all of our people, in the right sort of way. So I, I really, you know, I think it's wonderful. I think we should have uh, further discussions about how do we protect our education in this time of our fiscal crisis, because it's going to impact all of us, not only natives, but non-natives as well. But I also wanted to um, present to, and I have to say that she's like a, she's like a Akhani. Akhani, like my sister-in-law. She is uh, married to a friend of mine, a colleague of mine. Uh, we're so happy about all of the things that she has done for the Canadian people and other Aboriginal people. And I know that her, her lessons and her teachings are going to be helpful to us. And so we wanted to leave, wrap her, come help me, wrap her in our blanket of knowledge. Let's step out here. Okay. Let's step out. We want to wrap her, wrap her in our blanket of knowledge from our people here in Southeast Alaska. Oh, yeah.